So uh, the tradition of this conference is that there is one person who you say the word neuroendocrine tumor, you look it up in Facebook, you look it up in Webster's Dictionary, and you see one man's photograph. And that's Dr. Richard Warner from Mount Sinai in, uh, in New York City. So without uh, a to-do, Dr. Richard Warner is going to talk about the basics. And we're going to start at the beginning, and each of the speakers will probably, like myself, give you a little bit of, of a refresher course as we go through. But Dr. Warner is the king, uh, and he's the guy who can take us from the beginning to the state of the art. Richard? It's a real pleasure. Thank you, Eugene. Good morning, everybody. It is a pleasure to see so many familiar faces and also so many new ones. Uh, we have an awful lot to say, and you're going to hear a lot as this uh, session, as this meeting goes on. And uh, it's really going to give you a full panorama of the landscape of carcinoid and neuroendocrine tumors. You are, the audience, a very heterogeneous mixed group. Some of you are ingenues, real newbies, beginners, in terms of your journey along with your neuroendocrine tumor disease, but you're not schooled in medical or scientific uh, areas, and some of the very basic things, the terms, are in themselves not uh, something with which you're familiar. Yet there are others here, many who, because of the dint of their profession or training, or else uh, through the passage of time, have become very knowledgeable and schooled in uh, the details of this disease. And so you know as much, or in some instances, perhaps more than your doctors. So some of you will not be familiar with even the simplest terms or words. Others, uh, if I take time to explain, are going to really feel slighted. And so what I want to emphasize is make notes of what you would wish to ask as a question later on and during the question-answer period. And don't be shy about asking the simplest things. What does mitosis mean? What does necrosis? What is apoptosis? Those and many other terms we're going to use, if you don't understand them, you really won't be able to get the benefit of all that's being said. The carcinoid tumor got its name because it's cancer-like, but not identical, so that it, like in science fiction, humanoid means like a human, but not identical, yet not something really different. And carcinoid is sort of an in-between, the true, really aggressive, dangerous, and more fastly growing tumors, and those that are totally benign and don't spread and don't have lethal potential. And carcinoids in between. But almost all carcinoids and other neuroendocrine tumors in this family of tumors have the potential to becoming, to become truly malignant. And so uh, we have to bear that in mind. I hate it when I get a pathology report that says benign carcinoid. That, uh, that's not something that can really be said easily uh, or, or correctly, and you should not accept that. That's the first consideration. Secondly, what do we see here in this picture? We see a person walking a bunch of dogs, but they're all different, yet they're all canines. They belong to the family of canines, and similarly, Though each, there are many breeds and varieties of, they're all canines. Similarly, to clarify what the difference is, which I've often been asked, between neuroendocrine tumors and carcinoid. Neuroendocrine tumors uh, are the family to which carcinoid belong, just like canines is the family to which all dogs belong. And like the difference, 
breeds of dogs. There is a variety of different neuroendocrine tumors, of which carcinoid happens to be the commonest. We'll mention a word or two about some of the others, which are rarer, but nonetheless are very important, especially if that's something you have. And here you see a listing of the uh, frequency with which these different tumors occur. Uh, I won't dwell on it extensively, but just to point out that about 75% of all neuroendocrine tumors are carcinoids. And as you will see, carcinoids can arise in a wide variety of areas in the body, although they're most common in the intestinal tract. Uh, especially the small bowel, but they're becoming increasingly frequently diagnosed in the rectum. And also, the uh, smaller percentage, actually 28% of all carcinoids arise in the lung. And uh, then the leftover 25% or one quarter of all neuroendocrine tumors, most of which, but not all, arise in the pancreas so in the so-called islet cells. And uh, these uh, constitute a wide variety. Some have no function. They don't make any hormones or chemicals, and, uh, but still can grow and spread. And the others have specific function depending on the type of cells from which they arise. And they, they're named after what, they, what substances they make, like gastrinoma makes gastrin, and causes certain symptoms of its own. Insulinoma makes insulin and causes symptoms of too much insulin, and so on. That's the, these tumors are increasingly rare, but nonetheless very important. And here we just have a listing of these different types of tumors and uh, what symptoms they might, may, might cause. And this, again, lists the distribution or the sites of, in which these, uh, uh, of these different tumors. As you can see, there are a number of observations about these tumors and, uh, and statistics that have been collected. I, I can't see very well from here again. I'm thinking that the, the slide should be self-explanatory. Maybe we can get a little help. All right. There we go. Okay, now we're going to succeed.
All right, we're back to the slide showing the different uh, types of gastroenteropancreatic nets, gipnets. Uh, and you see carcinoid at the top, which makes serotonin and some other substances called tachykinins, bradykinins, and these produce the carcinoid syndrome, but that syndrome does not occur in all patients with carcinoid in maybe at the most uh, about 30 or 40 percent, but more often not that many, and particularly, however, with those that arise in the small intestine. And we'll devote a little more attention to that later. And uh, you see the listing of the, some of the major uh, uh, pancreatic uh, uh, other neuroendocrine nets when the substances that they produce and the symptoms produced. We won't take up time dwelling on that. If you have one of these, you can see what uh, it, substances it makes and the symptoms uh, that would occur as a consequence. And the distribution we uh, alluded to before, uh, showing that uh, most of the carcinoids arise in the gastrointestinal system uh, and uh, or second there are secondly in the lung two percent of all gastroenteropancreatic malignancies uh, are are neuroendocrine tumors it's only two percent all the others the common pancreas cancers stomach cancers colorectal cancers uh, constitute the vast majority of such tumors. Only a small percentage of, carcin of the, these lesions are carcinoids or neuroendocrine. That's why they're called orphan disease, orphan tumors. And these can be functioning or non-functioning, a term you may hear. Functioning means they produce substances that are making symptoms, so like serotonin, for example but not all of them are functioning, not by no means at all. And some that aren't apparently functioning, if they spread and grow bigger, may become functioning because the larger volume of tumors is enough to make enough uh, hormones that, they, that it would produce to cause symptoms. Microscopically, and this is very important, microscopically on biopsy, they all look the same. Very close. It's very difficult, for example, to differentiate by standard appearance and standard staining between, say, a gastrinoma and a carcinoid. Special stains, special uh, uh, testing is necessary. And you'll hear a little more about that in a few moments. Also, when, when these tumors are first uh, diagnosed, where they arise is very important. Those that uh, uh, arise most of the time from the digestive tract that differ, for example, those in the Extended, and this is very important uh, and one of the areas that, that is receiving great attention to make an earlier diagnosis. Those in the lung are about half and half. Uh, they will have some at least regional lymph nodes involved at the time they're first diagnosed. Now, you'll hear more from the pathology lecture that will follow, but um, there are criteria that must be met for what we consider a minimally adequate pathology report on a biopsy. 
It has to cite where the tissue came from. It has to uh, indicate whether the sample is a metastasis or the primary tumor. It has to be graded. That means its deg degree of aggressiveness has to be stated. And uh, the way of doing that nowadays is considered not only the differentiation of the tumor, that means how much it resembles the tissue from which it, uh, the cell type from which it originated, and how much uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, proliferation index is, that's so called KI67 or MIB MIB1 staining properties. And then also, we want to measure stain for chromogranin, synaptophysin, and some statement has to be stated as to the extent of the tumor so it can be staged. You'll hear more about this as the uh, uh, conference goes on. Now, looking at the degrees of cell growth, there will be a mitosis count, and you see circled the uh, the, the mitosis, meaning the cells which are in the process of dividing and replicating, multiplying, or in other words, the more of these that are undergoing mitosis, the faster the tumor is growing. So the mitosis rate is very important. KI67 is a st substance in the nucleus of the cell which undergoes a change as the cell is preparing or undergoing a replication, and this will stain specifically. And so the, doing that type of stain and looking at it under the microscope will help tell what the rate of growth or aggressiveness or so-called proliferation index of the cell is. No, no pathology report is adequate without that type of stain. It's not good enough just to get a path report that says carcinoid or, or even just neuroendocrine tumor. Again, addressing the question of differentiation, a well-differentiated cell or tumor cell will look like the tumor cell, or the cell type from which it originated. And here we see a brick wall, and it, it, you might say it's well differentiated. Every brick looks like every other brick. They're all the same. And here's a moderately differentiated brick wall in which the cells are essentially the same size, the bricks, but uh, they differ a bit in their coloration. So they're sort of not quite all identical, but they're very similar. And then here's a poorly differentiated stone wall. The stones are all different colors and sizes and shapes. And so they don't represent any one stone that they take after. And similarly, a poorly differentiated tumor is going to have different cells, different sizes, different shapes, and that speaks for a more aggressive growth. So the differentiation is a very important feature to be described. And here is a, a segment of intestine that's been removed and sliced open long ways. And you can see the folds of the lining, the mu mucus lining of the, of the intestine, and several little lumps, polyps, nodules, if you wish. And these were multiple small carcinoid tumors. And as you'll see on the next slide, this is a bit of a magnification of one of those nodules on cross-section. And I want to point to you, there are layers to the intestine. And here you see the, a thin layer running over this yellowish um, mass in the center. And that's the, the mucosa, the lining. And these tumors originate at the base of those that uh, lining. But then deep to that, in the middle of this piece of intestine is a darker layer. That's the muscular layer. And if you look closely, you can see some strands of the yellow tumor infiltrating through that layer and going into the uh, tissue just beyond, the which is called the serosa. The serosa is the outer coating of the intestine. And even a little bit is 
worked its way through the serosa. So this small tumor, which in this instance is no more than a centimeter or a little, about a third of an inch in diameter, has already extended through the full thickness of the intestinal wall, taking a little snip of it from the surface from inside the, the intestine with, a, with a, an endoscope is not going to remove it. It's only going to get a sample. This has to be removed in toto with the whole segment of the intestine in which it arises. As far as symptoms that for which, with which these tumors present, and we're talking now about the commonest, namely the small intestinal carcinoids, abdominal pain, and it may be for in and, off, in, in and out, on and off for years, and it's not always diagnosed right away because uh, for every tummy ache, you're not submitted for a, for a CAT scan or for complicated x-rays or things like that. And it may often be considered, especially when it gets better by itself and doesn't occur, but once every couple of months, it may be considered irritable bowel or just uh, anxiety and nervous. Or then if you begin to get some diarrhea, maybe it'll be thought to be inflammatory bowel disease like ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. Other symptoms may be severe pain from time to time, which are transient episodes of obstruction. Again, that's often put, passed off and just watched and then finally gets worse enough and then an operation ensues or x-rays and shows that there's obstruction due to the tumor. Less commonly, but common enough that it occurs uh, in a recognized frequency, is bleeding. The surface of the tumor may become raw, ulcerated, and bleed. So it can be one of the many causes of bleeding in the intestine and has to be considered. Then uh, when it becomes more far advanced, a mass, a lump, may be felt by, a per by the patient themselves or by the doctor examining, and that's the tumor that has arisen, maybe even a metastasis from the tumor. And then in a certain percentage of cases, as I said, less than 40%, uh, the carcinoid syndrome, the main features of which are diarrhea and facial flushing, may occur and be the presenting cause. Well, flushing, getting red in the face, is very common, and it's not unique just for carcinoid. It comes from things uh, as simple as menopause or embarrassment, or some people have it as a, as, a, as a constitutional feature. They always get red in the face when they exercise. Uh, and then there's also rosacea, which is a dermatologic condition, the origin of which is not really clear, and it's often a wastebasket into which flushing is, is uh, cast and uh, really is due to many other things. So there are many diseases that can cause flushing. The outstanding feature of the carcinoid flush is that it's dry. That you don't sweat, it's not wet, uh, there's not dampness, and so on. So uh, any flush that's with a great deal of sweating is not carcinoid flush. Finally, the, sim the disease may be found purely coincidentally. Person gets a gallbladder operation for gallstones or what was thought to be gallstones, and lo and behold, it wasn't. There's carcinoid there, or carcinoid coincidentally. The same thing holds for carcinoids of the lung. There are often coincidental findings. You're going to have a, a, a surgery for any anything, any other cause, and you have a preoperative chest X-ray, and lo and behold, there's a little round nodule in your lung. So the, the case is, cl is closed off and, and the workup takes place and it's found to be carcinoid. That's not an unusual finding. Uh, we may also have recurrent episodes of infection, pneumonia or chronic bronchitis, but it always occurs in the same part of the lung and that's due to the tumor that's obstructing the bronchus and the secretions collect behind it. We may have coughing producing some blood, and that can be from carcinoid in the lung. Or maybe a dry chronic cough also may be carcinoid. 
or maybe it first presents with the distant metastases, a lump in the liver, or, or a mass is found on a coincidental CAT scan or sonogram that is done for various other purposes. And then finally, we may have uh, a syndrome such as the carcinoid syndrome or other types of syndromes that are produced by hormones that the tumor may make. Uh, the lung carcinoids have the potential for making more different substances than do those from the digestive tract. And one of the uh, most interesting or unusual syndromes is the Cushing syndrome, which is due to a excessive production of a hormone called ACTH that stimulates the adrenals to make excess of cortisone, and that causes diarrhea or, or um, weight loss, obesity, hypertension, and a red flush of its own. Now here are listed the features of carcinoid syndrome. They're divided arbitrarily into major and minor features, and they need not all be present. But usually the, the hallmark is flushing, getting hot and red in the face. And I'll show you a picture of a gentleman who gave me his permission to show his picture, who had very early carcinoid syndrome. And uh, you will see what I've been talking about. Diarrhea, which is, may be painless and may be intermittent, uh, and uh, is also a f frequent symptom of carcinoid. Pellagra, which is a vitamin de deficiency disease, uh, deficiency of vitamin B3, niacin, uh, is because if you have a serotonin-producing tumor, it gobbles up all the tryptophan in the blood, which is the precursor, the substance from which B3 is made, and so you become deficient in that, and you get this uh, disease, pellagra, which is not well recognized in, in our society because we have uh, foods that are loaded with extra vitamins. Uh, every loaf of bread has vitamins of different types, all cereals and so forth, including B3, but in people who are starved or don't eat well or in third world countries, uh, deficiency is, is more common. And if carcinoid occurs, then pellagra may occur. And pellagra actually uh, is present, at least in a subclinical way, in one third of all patients presenting with carcinoid syndrome. And the main features of pellagra are like carcinoid diarrhea, and who needs that on top of the carcinoid syndrome, diarrhea? Also, it's uh, uh, mental changes, emotional uh, changes, depression or hallucinations, etc., and a skin rash, pigmentation and changes, especially in parts of the skin that are exposed to the sun. So part of our treatment of all carcinoid syndrome patients is simply to give extra niacin be, uh, and it's done prophylactically, it's easy just to take uh, an extra dose of niacin in many of the multiple vitamin preparations. Venous telangiectasia, little spiders uh, on your nose or on your cheeks, these are characteristic of carcinoid syndrome and become worse as, as the time progresses. Uh, heart manifestations used to be very common and then improved, and now we're beginning to, with carcinoid patients living much longer, are beginning to be seen again more frequently. Uh, the, apparently, the serotonin has an effect causing fibrosis, scarring on the surface of certain of the heart valves, particularly on the right side of the heart. And this causes impairment in the heart action, and we get carcinoid valve heart disease and we've been treating that when it's far advanced by replacing the valve, and it works wonderfully. Only thing is, you've got to control the blood serotonin levels, or if it's a biological valve that's replaced, it, the disease may recur. If you use a mechanical valve, a uh, metal or plastic valve, then uh, 
you won't have recurrent disease, but you've got to be on anticoagulants the rest of your life. And if you're going to get chemotherapy or have more surgery, which is very frequent for this disease, then, then you know, you're going to have problems with the anticoagulation. <clears throat> Finally, most patients have an enlarged liver because metastases are present and that is considered the usual part of the syndrome. There are minor features. Peptic ulcer is a, a present in one-third of the cases. Very low serum albumin, again because of the, di the cannibalizing of the tryptophan, an essential amino acid, by the serotonin production. Undue wasting of muscles, atrophy of muscles, joint pains, uh, a, a scarring in the muscles, and then in a atypical case of unusual type of chemistry, uh, a very brownish discoloration of the skin and swelling of the feet occur. And finally, it is very frequently encountered that uh, blood sugar levels, glucose levels, are increased in carcinoid syndrome. And this also occurs with chronic octreotide treatment. And nowadays, it's also seen with the um, administration of uh, some of the, the mTOR inhibitors, like Afinitor, Everolimus. And here's a gentleman uh, with uh, nice rosy cheeks. And this is actually an early carcinoid flush. And I thank him for his voluntarily allowing his picture to be shown. Not every red face is carcinoid, I emphasize, but nonetheless, it has to be suspected. Now, there is such a thing as carcinoid crisis, and it deserves some consideration. This is a, a group of symptoms of severe carcinoid syndrome, which can be precipitated by a variety of things, particularly uh, stressful events, uh, things that cause uh, release of adrenaline-like substances in the body that trigger off the release of you know, the chemicals from the carcinoid tumor. Most usually, a uh, very fall, severe fall in blood pressure occurs. Rarely it can be a spike in blood pressure. And this can occur at the beginning of anesthesia or sur surgery or, or some stressful uh, life event and the person can go into shock. The heart beats very rapidly, tachycardia. They become weak. They become short of breath. They may get wheezing due to bronchospasm, like asthma. And if they're given the usual adrenergic, adrenaline-like substances to help the low blood pressure, it worsens the situation. And this is the reason why every carcinoid patient, even if they don't have a known syndrome, before undergoing surgery, should be given a prophylactic uh, injection of, uh, of uh, octreotide or even have a, a continuous intravenous infusion going on with that uh, uh, substance during the surgery. As you can see, calcium infusion can also provoke this syndrome, this crisis. I'm not going to dwell a long time on this uh, slide because we can give a lecture on it itself. It just shows the different volumes and types of fluids that enter into the digestive tract and underlie the different types of diarrhea. Uh, the di uh, uh, starting with what the fluid you take by mouth and going on to the, the volume of fluid that saliva the fluid that is produced by the stomach, the digestive juices, acid, the intestinal secretions, the biliary secretions, the, uh, uh, the uh, absorption uh, from the colon of, uh, of the fluid. Actually, uh, uh, at least eight liters of fluid are, are, are uh, presented in, in the digestive tract and yet in the course of a day, and yet only 200 milliliters uh, end up in the normal stool output, and that's because of reabsorption. Many things can promote 
diarrhea, loose and frequent stools, such as simply a surgery in which the intestine is shortened, so there's not an opportunity to reabsorb. There may be toxic materials, uh, uh, say, like cholera, uh, that infection re uh, provides a toxin that paralyzes the absorption and in, 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 of uh, secretions. So voluminous f fluid volumes are excreted and so on. Serotonin and some of the other products of carcinoid will uh, impair uh, the absorption and, or the secretion and this uh, balance between fluid production and reabsorption and hence can account for the diarrhea. And uh, similarly, uh, in one of the well-known uh, um, uh, neuroendocrine tumor syndromes called Vipoma, VIP. Sub, it's a substance that's produced by certain cells in the pancreas, and when the, they overgrow in, in forming a Vipoma, then we get an excess of VIP, which overstimulates the intestine, and we get a voluminous diarrhea. Uh, so uh, there are many causes and many mechanisms. It's in the, and some of these diarrheas have nothing to do with eating, that you have it whether you eat or don't eat. And this is important. Certain types of diarrhea occur even at night when you're sleeping. And that's important for us to know because that helps to tip off that it's what we call secretory diarrhea it's due to an impairment in the secretion and reabsorption of these fluids. Now, how is carcinoid diagnosed? Well, the first thing that's important is it's got to be suspected. If you don't think of it, you don't make the diagnosis. So the motto, if you don't suspect it, you can't detect it. And uh, that's also why the zebra is the icon for, for carcinoid and neuroendocrine tumors. When you hear hoofbeats, you think of horses. So when a doctor sees somebody with a common symptom like abdominal pain or diarrhea, he thinks of the common causes, but you've got to think outside the box. And instead of a herd of horses, it might, there might be a zebra in there. So that's why the icon. And at any rate, once it's suspected, then you can do things to diagnose. You can test for the blood markers <coughs> or the urine markers, mar the chemistries, the substances that are produced by these tumors, and they should be increased and we'll give you a list of those in a moment. Then we can do imaging, x-rays, CAT scans, MRIs, etc., or even endoscopies to look and see directly, and those that will help. And then finally, to clinch the diagnosis, a biopsy. It's not really proven until you have a tissue diagnosis. And so those are the, the four uh, columns that support the diagnosis. Here are for markers. The classic one is urine 5-HIAA, standing for 5-hydroxyendolacetic acid, which is the traditional way uh, of measuring. And that requires uh, uh, 24 hours of urine and on a diet that doesn't contain foods that have lots of serotonin in them. And even then, the value will not be increased in about one quarter to one third of the cases. And so you will, if you rely on that alone, you'll miss some cases. Secondly, blood serotonin is very good too. It's even in cases that don't have carcinoid syndrome, it is often slightly elevated. So careful measurements will help. Then we measure chromogranin A which is another co-produced substance, but it doesn't cause symptoms. However, it's very often elevated. <coughs> and we like to do all of these substances, uh, not just one, because sometimes only one of them is elevated. Now, there are other markers or chemical products. Well, first, we'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, regarding chromogranin A, which is very popular to be test for testing, there are many things that can throw off 
the value and it has to be considered. First of all, it has to be done fasting as, as do these other markers. If there's kidney impairment, if there's liver impairment, that will cause an elevated value. If you're on a PPI, proton pump inhibitor, one of the uh, uh, drugs that are used so commonly to reduce gastric acid, like uh, pro Protonex and the uh, Protonix, Prevacid, uh, the, the, the uh, Nexium, just to name a few. Uh, if a person's on those drugs, that'll be an elevated chromogranin A, and you can't just stop it overnight. It's got to be stopped a long time ahead. Uh, sometimes if, they, if you've been on them for a long time, I find you have to stop it for at least a month. And if it's necessary for stomach symptoms, that's not always easy to do. Uh, if there's a surgery and part of the stomach called the antrum is still left in, that can cause elevation. If you have a gastrinoma and the Zollinger-Ellison syndrome, or if you have atrophic gastritis, as in accompanying pernicious anemia, for example, you get an elevated uh, serum gastrin. If you have inflammatory bowel disease, like uh, very active Crohn's disease, that can cause an elevation. And finally, if you're under great physical stress, for example, I've seen some people who run uh, marathons and uh, then have some diarrhea afterwards, and their chromogranin A is measured, and it's high. So, wow, everybody's afraid they have carcinoid, but it's the result of the physical stress. Now, some of the other markers, neuron-specific enolase is not specific for carcinoid. Uh, substance P is relied upon often and is helpful. Pancreatic polypeptide, another substance which is sometimes elevated, particularly with, uh, with uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Pancreastatin, which is a product of chromogranin A, is one that I like very much, which uh, not only is often elevated, uh, but also uh, the magnitude of its elevation correlates with the, the prognosis for the disease. Neurokinin A is another one, subunit of uh, human chorionic gonadotropin is infrequently elevated. And finally, CEA, carcinoembryonic antigen, which is so important in measuring or determining the presence of metastases for ordinary colorectal cancer or breast or many other types of malignancy, uh, is almost never elevated in neuroendocrine tumors. And when it is, it carries a very serious bad prognosis or indicates the coexistence of another type of tumor, which occurs in about anywhere from 15 to 25 percent of all carcinoids. You get a second cancer uh, at some time. Now back to standard imaging. Regular plain x-ray, a chest film, shows a lump in the lung, a CAT scan, an MRI, you'll hear more about these as the meeting, as the conference goes on. Sonography, ultrasound, and we do it internally now with a, a scope, that, an endoscope that can uh, have the probe that, uh, that does the ultrasonography internally so it's very close to the organs that are being studied. We can do isotope bone scans that are helpful. And the uh, Octrio scan, which is in the United States, the gold standard, you'll hear more about that. Uh, it, it's going to be eventually re replaced by Gallium 68 scan, which I know you're going to hear about, which is already replacing it in Europe. And some of you have had that scan. It's being used experimentally here at present. And then finally, the FDG PET, the standard PET scan, which is used for many malignancies, depends upon the met metabolism or the rate of growth of the tumor. And now, in ordinary car cancer carcinoma, the tumors are growing much more rapidly than with carcinoid or, or neuroendocrine tumors, so they require more energy 
Therefore, they gobble up and use sugar and glucose in the body for their energy source. And if we take uh, uh, fluorodeoxyglucose, which is FDG, with, to which the radioisotope is attached, uh, that u is used for the PET scan, and administer that, then the tumor will attract the, uh, and use extra glucose, extra sugar, and more the isotope will, will register there, and it will show on a scan. But usually, neuroendocrine tumors are more sluggish and slower growing, and so they don't take up the, this material, and they won't register on the scan. And uh, if somebody is relying upon the FDG PET scan to make the diagnosis, they're going to miss it. On the other hand, if a neuroendocrine tumor does register, on a FDG PET scan, it suggests it's more aggressive than the average. So I use it to help tell me about the aggressiveness, not to make the diagnosis. And here are some other comments. The EUS endoscopic ultrasound is very good for visualizing lesions in the pancreas because this probe is pushed into the stomach as part of a, a upper endoscopy, and the, only the thin wall of the stomach is in between the tip of the probe and the pancreas. And, and so that instead of doing it from the outside of the body, you can do it that this way and pick up little tiny lesions. What you do about them is another issue. <coughs> we have the wireless capsule or pill camera where you swallow this little, this pill and it can take pictures internally and, and register them on a monitor outside the body and so small lesions can often be seen that way better than any other way. And then we have now the double balloon uh, endoscopy technique which also sees lesions inside the, the gut but can biopsy them unlike the pill camera. And here very quickly are some samples this is uh, a standard uh, Octrio scan. The black or dark stuff is the increased focus of isotope. The, the big round one at the bottom is in the urinary bladder, which is where the, the material is excreted and doesn't represent a tumor. But up above in the liver are some of the heavy black spots, and these are metastases. You will hear more about this. And then the gallium 68 scan on, on the left side is, is the Octrio scan, and on the right is gallium scan, and look at all the dark spots there are. Much more sensitive, shows them better. You'll hear about this later on. And now here, one is a CAT scan, and one is a MRI, and you see in the liver the structure on the left side and both the views of these uh, uh, circular areas, which are metastases. And they both, they, they're, they're seen in both of these techniques. And here, an endoscopic view. And this is a small carcinoid in the stomach, the little lesion there, magnified. That's, that's, that's probably about uh, half a centimeter or so in size. And here, is an angiogram done by a catheter that was placed in through the, the, the arterial system, threaded under the fluoroscope, up into the uh, blood circulation the, that goes to the, the, the liver and uh, branch that branches that go to tumors uh, were injected with a, a dye contrast, and it outlines those big round cannonballs you see are va vascular tumors, and this technique is used for injecting radioisotope-bearing particles or chemotherapy targeted right to that so-called CERT, Selective Internal Radiotherapy. And here is a, an endoscopic sonography of a rectal carcinoid, a little small one. At the bottom of the picture, you see a little gray area, and then in the, in the insert, you see a little irregularity. That's a very small carcinoid. 
and it's the capsule. And then finally, a word about treatment. It's divided into two, two types, supportive or three types. Supportive treatment, like octreotide, uh, surgery of a wide variety, and then anti-proliferative chemotherapy, radiation treatment, and so forth. You'll hear more about all of these. And at this point, I think I'll terminate what I've had to say. <laughs>